if all, if all ecological and evolutionary processes could be likened to different varieties of cheese, then I think that ecological neutral theory could perhaps be likened to the dry, tasteless cracker against which we can truly appreciate the flavour of these different varieties of cheese. And just as we can't appreciate the cheeses by combining them together in a complex dish, we cannot appreciate the dif different uh, ecological and evolutionary processes by packing them all into an overly complex model. And so, what one way around this is to start with a very simple basic model like ecological neutral theory and add to that only the processes that are of particular interest to us. For the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to say any more to justify ecological neutral theory, only that None of the, nobody actually believes the world is neutral. It's just about making some assumptions and seeing where they get us. What interests me for this talk is about the macroevolutionary predictions of neutral theory. And it turns out that to coax neutral theory to make good macroevolutionary predictions, we need to add a new ingredient to that dry cracker, some perturbations from neutrality itself with a nearly neutral theory of ecology and macroevolution. So, what's wrong with the existing neutral theory? Well, that can be illustrated with this lineages through time plot. On the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, the number of lineages in a phylogeny. And it's already in logarithmic space, and yet we see this extreme upturn in diversification, which is hardly ever observed empirically, and certainly not generally, whereas however we play with the parameters, we always get this unrealistic pattern. It is, in fact, another instance of a problem that has been pointed out repeatedly by people like Ripplex, Nee, and others. The fact that ecological drift at the heart of neutral theory is too slow to explain certain patterns. Another way to think about it is to think, well, if all individuals now are being assumed to be ecologically equivalent, and some of those were alive at the same time as those from a previous generation, and therefore those two generations are ecologically equivalent, and the generation before that, and the generation before that, and so we are actually implicitly assuming that everything has always been equivalent, and that nothing changes, even over deep evolutionary time. No wonder this doesn't do a good job of evolutionary patterns, and yet the rewards are potentially high of trying to fix this up, because then we would have an individual-based model that includes both ecological patterns and evolutionary ones. So one possible solution to this is a nearly neutral model. Now, I'm not talking about some of the pre-existing and interesting work on nearly neutral models in ecology, where neutral theory is at one end and other ecological models at the other, like niche theory, for example. What I'm talking about is something that is far more um, motivated by the nearly neutral theory of uh, molecular evolution. And this is the way that the model progresses. So we start with number of individuals, and uh, in each time step there's a death event, and that leaves a gap to be replaced by the offspring of another individual chosen at random. And under pure neutral theory, these would be chosen from these five with equal probability. Under nearly neutral theory, they would be chosen with slightly different probabilities, each species having a thickness of form 1 plus s where S could be small, and when it tends to zero, you recover the original neutral model. Occasionally you get speciation, and new species inherit the fitness of the species from which they evolve, however, with a slightly higher or slightly lower fitness. So what comes out of this model? Well, this bar chart shows, for four different points in time, represented with four different colours, the distribution of different fitnesses we have in the system. And we see a very peaked distribution, so it is really nearly neutral. There is not much difference between individuals and species alive at any one time in terms of their fitness. But if you wind the clock forwards, you have actually a wave of fitness that is travelling and moving. And it moves, in fact, uh, like clockwork, as perhaps you might expect it to. The, this is even one simulation. This isn't an average of a number of simulations, and yet you see a very constant rate of progression of this travelling wave of fitness. It is, in fact, emergent behaviour, which I think is completely consistent with the Red Queen hypothesis. In this model, a lineage has to evolve and produce newer and fitter species in order to keep up with the other lineages which are doing the same possibly to keep up with a changing environment, 
possibly to keep up with parasites that are getting better at co combating them, and possibly just continuing uh, progress towards solving suboptimal <coughs> problems in the species. Another pattern that comes out of this model is that species tend to begin with a higher per capita fitness, and that fitness rate, for the same reasons, declines through its time, and so a species would wax and wane. Rather than just ecologically drifting, as under pure neutral theory, the drift is slightly biased towards increase to begin with, and then towards decrease near the end of the species' life, which is in fact uh, what is typically observed in paleontology, that species rise and fall like that. So now on to the uh, ecological and evolutionary predictions. This is the linkage to time plot you can probably remember from pure neutral theory and next to it I'm putting some ecological predictions. This is the rank abundance distribution and the octave class. These are just two different ways of displaying the same species abundance distribution which is a log series. That's pure neutral theory. Introduce a little bit of, of selection, a little bit of nearly neutralness and we get not much difference. The linear to time plot looks slightly better in my opinion, but there's not much in it yet. By the time S gets to 0.01, we now get something that is looking a lot better. So for instance, in the species abundance distribution, we still have something that is rather like a log series. In fact, I believe it to be mathematically exactly like a log series, except for in its tail, which shows a number of particularly common species, and indeed that is a problem with original neutral theory that it couldn't explain really common species purely by drift. How would you get common like that? Now here you can get common by being a bit fitter and then by getting lucky with the drift you can get to be significantly common for a time, and then eventually you'll go extinct still. On the limited to time clock we have something that looks qualitatively at least rather like the very prevalent birth model of diversification and it also has exactly the same little tick upwards of the pull of the present from that model. But we do know that that can be resolved with protracted speciation, which isn't the main topic of this talk, but just to prove it, I've included it for you. The idea that speciation is not instantaneous but takes time is one way that that uh, upwards tick can be uh, resolved on these models. So now, one more pattern I want to show you is the rates of evolution. So remember there are these waves of fitness that are travelling through time. How fast do they travel and how does that depend on the model? Well, for me the most interesting uh, parameter that it depends on is the meta-community size. The bigger the meta-community, the faster this wave travels, the faster the rate of evolutionary progress or ability to uh, keep up with a changing environment. And that, again, is anecdotally um, in agreement with, with what I've, I've heard from and read from uh, much research on the, the subject. And in fact, it has implications for uh, invasive species and for island biogeography, because it suggests that once an island has been initially colonised, the species, after time, they may diversify on the island, but they are sitting ducks. They are simply inferior in terms of thickness, albeit by a small amount, to the mainland species which have had the evolutionary ability to march forward faster. That may not be true, but if it is, then there's potentially uh, implications there. Um, I find it uh, strange, in a way, to be saying this as the person who, who came up as a, a neutral theorist and, and began studying that field, but it seems to me that, um, of course, species are not the same. And not only are they different, but perhaps some of them are actually literally superior to others, which doesn't seem to be the main way, the mainstream way of thinking, but it is what comes out of this model, and in a way it makes sense. It's compatible with the idea of evolution by natural selection, and as long as you have change taking place and, and the fitter individuals reproducing then um, perhaps uh, some of, of, of these species are in fact just, just overall superior, albeit by a very small amount. And finally, uh, just a, I'm afraid, shameless promotion of something quite different, uh, my website at onezoom.org where anyone who's interested in macroevolution can go to explore huge phylogenies zooming in and out and panning like you would on Google Maps. It's done with a fractal layout and it can show us very humblingly how insignificant we are compared to even all tetrapods as you can see in this diagram there. So please do have a look. And in my final conclusion, I'd just like to say 
we do all know the world isn't neutral, but perhaps it could be nearly neutral. And with that, thank you, and I'll take any questions. change it, but I suspect that would make things even worse, um, because the, the problem with, with neutral theory and pure drift is that in fact you get something that's rather like the coalescent in terms of the phylogeny. And uh, another question would be what happens if you make it spatially explicit? Again, the problem gets worse. The issue is that you, you wait a long time for those last coalescence events, and so you, you I've, I've tried a lot of things to try and iron out these extreme upturns. And I don't see anything within neutral theory that can do it, or at least nothing that is I would consider forced. So, for example, if you had a meta community that was increasing in, in size exponentially fast, then you could iron it out. But then I can't accept that, that as a general explanation of how to fix the model, because meta communities aren't all increasing exponentially fast. So perhaps it doesn't quite answer your question, but I've, I've said what I can immediately say about it. Hopefully that's interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So how can one interpret this pattern of sort of ever-increasing fitness over time in the model? Is that something that sort of, does that have an implication for this? increasing over time? Will the population of the better community at large? So what's the interpretation of it? Yeah. Well, uh, one interpretation is that, well, it is an emergent behaviour of a model in which you are assuming essentially that new species arrive. In fact, the expected fitness of a new species is exactly the same in this model as the fitness of, of the parents. I didn't say that, but we assume equal probability of increase and decrease. But I suspect even with adjusting that, you would get similar patterns. Uh, so, as an emergent behaviour, I would interpret it as um, evolution does have a direction, even if only a temporal direction, that the environment is changing and so species need to change as well. But it could it could be a direction of, of further optimization. I mean, after all, the species that we see are not perfect. Further optimizations are possible. So one implication would be, even if the environment were constant, um, then one would expect that further optimizations could happen, that they would happen faster in the larger communities. And uh, from that, I would suggest that although, of course, Things like, um, like like niches and other factors that are very well studied are important and will continue to be environmental differences. Yes, it does perhaps suggest that there's another force of just straightforward progress that's perhaps being ignored because it's unpalatable. But in in nature, perhaps that is happening, however slowly, and has some effects over evolutionary time scales, even though it's not known so ecologically. So um, it's it's perhaps uh, not true, but it's an idea I'd like to put forward and get people thinking about. Any other questions? Yeah. What are the formula in terms of one minus s one plus s, which then doesn't have this inherent. What is? So you want me to do, you want me to um, explain a bit more about where the one plus s comes from? No, no. We get one minus s one plus s. So you have the you have the spectrum. I suspect that would come out in the wash. I mean, actually, the way the, the increase in fitness is is implemented by multiplying by 1 plus s, so increasing that power, and the decrease is implemented by dividing, so decreasing the power by 1. You could move over to an additive rather than a subtractive mode of evolution, but I think that um, regardless of, of what mode of evolution, what, sorry, what, what distribution of fitness change upon speciation you implement, you would always get that, that increase, um, yeah, or at least a slower, a slower decrease. Yeah. Um, please, anyone else with questions, I'd love to speak to you to later. 